Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, before we get started, I, uh, I know that there's a lot of attention on the campaign trail today, uh, as there should, particularly uh, because Michelle's network, network is hosting a uh, big debate tonight uh, in Houston. I suspect many of you will be watching. Uh, and there actually is a question that came to my mind that I thought I'd put forward for consideration tonight. It's a pretty basic one, and it's one that Republicans are quite intimately familiar with. It's simply this. Do you believe America is better off than it was seven years ago? The case that we have to make that America uh, is certainly better off than it was seven years ago is quite strong. Uh, and I've got uh, a couple of slides here to show you uh, that, um, that substantiate that. Let's try a little uh, technology wiz technological wizardry here and see if this works. Hmm. <laughs> or not. Or not. Let's see if this one works. No. Okay. So, we'll give you the slides. There we go. There we go. There we go. Let's go slide with the slide number one. Since the Great Recession, household wealth in the United States, net worth, has increased by $30 trillion. Uh, that obviously uh, greatly exceeds the pace of the recovery from the uh, only economic downturn that was worse than the one that we experienced in 2007 and 2008. Uh, that obviously is a testament to uh, what American households uh, have recovered from. Uh, let's go to the second slide. Uh, and you'll see that if you take a look at the growth of the U.S. economy, uh, our recovery is actually faster than the rec recovery that was experienced by other advanced economies in the world. In fact, the U.S. economy has recovered faster than any other advanced economy in the world. Now let's go to the third slide. Unemployment rate, this is probably the most accessible measure that people have used. Uh, but when you take a look at our unemployment rate, it has uh, been cut in half. We're now down to 4.9 percent. That obviously exceeds uh, the predictions that were made uh, earlier on in our recovery. So it's not just that we've cut the unemployment rate in half. We cut the unemployment rate even faster uh, than most people thought uh, uh, was possible. Uh, it's certainly faster than the previous Republican nominee for president uh, thought was possible. He famously uh, vowed to get the unemployment rate down to 6 percent by the end of his first term. Uh, and already we've got the unemployment rate down below 5 percent. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the housing market has been the uh, uh, intense focus of a lot of uh, uh, evaluation. And we've seen the uh, housing market in the United States recover quite strongly. Uh, and one way to take a measure of that uh, is by looking at the number of foreclosures per month. Uh, the number of foreclosures in the United States by month uh, have, uh, uh, are only about a quarter of what they once were. Uh, again, that is a testament to uh, strengthening of, uh, uh, of our economy and, and certainly is a way that a lot of middle class families uh, can relate to. Let's go to the next slide. We've talked a lot about the uh, uh, success of the uh, U.S. auto industry. Uh, obviously, auto sales in the United States have grown by uh, two-thirds since 2009. Um, there are obviously a whole lot of jobs associated with this. The President made an important decision early on, early on in his presidency, uh, a decision that was not uh, particularly popular, uh, not even particularly popular in the state of Michigan that had a lot to gain. Uh, but yet we've seen the American auto industry come back uh, stronger than ever. And one way to evaluate that is that uh, auto sales uh, have increased by 67 percent uh, just in the last seven years. Uh, Go to the next slide. One of the core investments uh, of the uh, Recovery Act uh, was in renewable energy uh, and ensuring that the United States was well positioned to benefit from the clean energy economy of the future. One way to evaluate that is in uh, are the investments that were made in solar. Uh, and we've seen that solar power capacity in the United States uh, has increased 25 times uh, since uh, the President took office. Uh, that is thanks in large part to uh, an important investment that was included in the Recovery Act, but it's an indication of how much potential exists for the U.S. economy as other countries around the world start to embrace uh, uh, clean energy. And uh, last but not least, uh, there's obviously there have been a lot of discussion, particularly on the campaign trail, but even here in our nation's capital, about health care reform. 
uh, one of the promises that the President made about health care reform was focusing on lowering health care costs. A lot, of a lot of ways to evaluate that, but the way that most Americans feel uh, health care costs is understanding how much they have to pay in premiums. The vast majority of Americans get their premiums from their employer or get their insurance from their employer. Uh, and when you take a look at premium growth uh, among people who get their health insurance from their employer, uh, premium growth has been cut almost in half. Uh, it's down to about 4.2 percent growth rate when previously uh, it was up near 8 percent. So uh, there are a lot of ways to evaluate uh, this, um, this question. Uh, but in some ways, the simplest questions uh, yield the most information. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, you know, this is a good example of that. Uh, I think by all the measures that I've just walked through, there's no denying uh, the, that the American people uh, and our nation uh, is in much better condition uh, than it was seven years ago. Uh, but we'll obviously see what the candidates have to say about it. So uh, with that uh, prelude, uh, we can now get on to the main event. Uh, Josh, you want to start? Great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, let's turn to the Supreme Court. Uh, just a little bit before you came out here this morning, or actually this afternoon, I should say, uh, Governor Sandoval uh, said that he told the White House he's not interested in the Supreme Court nomination. Now that he's uh, out of the running, so to speak, can you tell us whether he was actually seriously being considered? <laughs> and, and is he emblematic of the type of mainstream candidate that the president feels might garner uh, enough support to be able to be confirmed? Uh, Josh, even after the fact, I'm not going to get into a lot of details about uh, who's on the president's list and who's not. Uh, in part, that is because the list is, uh, is not final at this point. So uh, the work that the president and his team are doing to find the very best person in America to fill the Supreme Court vacancy uh, is ongoing. Uh, and for the kind of criteria that the president will use in evaluating potential nominees, uh, I'd encourage you to take a close look at the at the blog that the President wrote on the SCOTUS blog yesterday, where he outlined uh, uh, how he will evaluate potential nominees to the court. The, um, the Quad City Times out in Iowa had a, an op-ed out this morning um, uh, about Senator Grassley saying that um, you know he's gripped the grenade, he's clutching and pulled the pin, and now it's only a matter of time before uh, the whole thing blows up in the Republican Party's collective face. I was wondering, is that how the White House sees this? And can you put this in the context of some of the uh, hard-fought uh, Senate and political um, f fights that are, are shaping up for some vulnerable members um, being asked about this now? Yeah. Well, look, Josh, that's, uh, that is some colorful imagery. I hadn't uh, seen that this morning. Look, I, 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 the way that we see this is that both the President of the United States and the United States Senate have a constitutional responsibility. And the Constitution says that if there's a vacancy in the Supreme Court, uh, the President should nominate someone to fill it, and the Senate should offer their advice and consent uh, about uh, that person's fitness uh, to serve on the Supreme Court. It's pretty straightforward, and this system, with some uh, uh, bumps along the way, has functioned and served the American people pretty well uh, over the last two centuries or so. However, what we see now is we see Republicans take what I think is a pretty unreasonable stand. Uh, and it does put Republicans in a position of somehow suggesting that there's some sort of exception that's written into the Constitution, that, uh, that the President's supposed to fill nominees, uh, fill vacancies on the Supreme Court, uh, except in an election year. And uh, that, uh, that doesn't really pass the smell test. With, uh, with most uh, Americans. I think people recognize that when they were voting in 2012 for president, they were voting to choose the person who would have in their power, have it in their power, to fill sup Supreme Court vacancies that opened up in the next four years. Importantly, they were also voting for 33 Senate seats. And they were electing the individual who will represent their state in the United States Senate, who will offer the President advice and consent over the next six years to fill the Supreme Court vacancy if one arose. So that's why you know, you've heard the rhetoric uh, from here that it's simply about doing your job. The President intends to do his job. In fact, he's already started doing the important work to prepare him to do that job, uh, and that is to evaluate 
uh, candidates, and we expect that the, uh, that the Senate uh, should do their job. Unfortunately, they're resting their case on insisting that they're not going to do their job and so that the president shouldn't bother. It's not really the way that it works. Uh, the way that this works is the president will do his job, he will nominate someone to fill that vacancy, and then there will be a, a responsibility that the Senate Republicans will have to decide whether or not they will accept uh, to fulfill their constitutional duty to offer the president uh, advice and consent on that nominee. How much uh, progress has the president made in that process that you just described? Has he started narrowing the list? Is he still looking broadly at a whole bunch of candidates? Uh, you know, where is he? He's still continuing to uh, review material that was provided uh, by, that's been provided by his team. Uh, they have updated the material that all of you saw him uh, carry home uh, with him uh, last Friday night. He spent a lot of time over the weekend reviewing that material, and he's continued to do that over the course of this week. The President's also continued to follow through on his promise to intensively consult uh, members of the United States Congress uh, on this. Uh, the President, as has been reported, the President had an opportunity yesterday when, uh, while Senator Hatch was at the White House for the bill signing uh, to have a conversation with him uh, in private uh, about this constitutional responsibility that both men have. Uh, that, was a, uh, that was a useful discussion. I, uh, again, it's consistent with uh, the variety of other phone calls and conversations that the President and members of his team uh, have had. I can tell you that at this point, uh, the White House has, con has contacted the office, at least, uh, of every member of the Judiciary Committee, both Democrat and Republican. Uh, in most cases, or in a lot of cases, those were uh, conversations with uh, individual senators. Uh, in some cases, it was conversations with members of their staff. Uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out future conversations uh, with members of the Judiciary Committee, but at this point, uh, at least every office, uh, both Democrat and Republican, has been uh, contacted. And uh, this kind of intensive consultation uh, will continue. This is consistent with the way that the President uh, consulted in advance of nominating individuals to fill the two previous Supreme Court vacancies that have occurred while he's been President, uh, and he'll do the same thing with this one. The last thing uh, I'll share with you, sort of process-wise here, is that uh, the other thing that the President did shortly after the two previous vacancies occurred is that he invited the Senate Majority Leader, the Senate Minority Leader, the Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the Ranking Member of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, to come to the White House and sit in the Oval Office and have a conversation to continue consulting uh, about the process for filling that vacancy. And uh, we're pleased that after uh, a number of conversations, some more awkward than others, uh, the, President, uh, that the President will be convening a meeting on Tuesday uh, here at the White House uh, with the uh, four individuals that I just described. Again, this is what we did in 2009 uh, when Justice Souter announced his uh, retirement, or shortly after. Uh, it's what we did in 2010, uh, shortly after uh, Justice Stevens announced his retirement. Uh, and uh, that's what the President will be doing on Tuesday. Uh, on one other topic, uh, I wanted to ask you about this agreement between the U.S. and China that we're learning about uh, for UN, UN Security Council mm -hmm. sanctions on North Korea. But what can you tell us about what those sanctions will look like? And do you see it as a positive sign uh, for uh, our diplomacy that uh, China seems uh, willing to take these uh, punitive actions that are one of their top allies. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, I don't have a lot of details at this point about what's included in the resolution. Obviously, this resolution has been the topic of extensive diplomatic conversations between the United States and China. Um, and uh, Ambassador Power up at the UN uh, intends to submit for consideration uh, a draft sanctions resolution uh, that would be a response to North Korea's flagrant violations of their uh, international obligations. And uh, I do think it, it is indicative of how uh, productive diplomacy can be. It's not easy, uh, but it certainly is an indication that the United States and China, when our interests are aligned, can cooperate quite effectively to advance the interests of citizens in both our countries. Uh, I would point out that these kinds of diplomatic discussions have occurred at a variety of levels. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, uh, Ambassador Rice, the President's National Security Advisor, uh, hosted a meeting here at the White House with uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Yi, to discuss this among other issues. Uh, so this is something that the President's National Security Team has worked assiduously 
uh, to make progress on. Um, Ambassador Power will um, present that uh, resolution for consideration uh, at the UN Security Council today. Uh, and once the UN Security Council has, has had more of an opportunity to formally consider the resolution, we can talk in a little bit more detail about what's actually included in the package. Thanks. Jeff. Josh, um, you mentioned the President's <coughs> excuse me, meeting with Senator Hatch. As Senator Hatch said after that uh, meeting that the President had said he was seeking a very moderate candidate. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Well, uh, again, Jeff, there was not a uh, – I'm not aware that there was a transcript of the, of the conversation. I think this was an opportunity just for the President to meet one-on-one uh, -on -one with Senator Hatch. Um, I think for people who are uh, interested in understanding from the President firsthand about what kind of person he intends to nominate, uh, I'd encourage them to check out the SCOTUS blog, uh, because there the President did lay out uh, in pretty direct terms what kind of nominee he believes would be most effective in filling the vacancy on the Supreme Court. And uh, this, you know, this, uh, this includes somebody with uh, impeccable le legal credentials, uh, somebody with the right kind of judgment and experience, somebody with a commitment to the rule of law. Um, and uh, th again, uh, that's how I would describe the criteria that the President will use in choosing uh, what he believes uh, would be the best person to fill the vacancy in the Supreme Court. Would you dispute his Senator Hatch's characterization of their conversation? Uh, Senator Hatch is certainly entitled to, uh, to share with uh, all of you what he remembers from that conversation. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in hearing from the President firsthand about what criteria he'll be using, uh, I'd encourage you to check out the SCOTUS blog. Um, Nancy Pelosi has said today she thought it's a good idea to look at both Republicans and Democrats. Um, that said, is the White House prepared for the reaction from the base that elected the president if you were or if he were to choose a Republican for this historic nomination? Uh, Jeff, as I, as I alluded to yesterday, there, there will be a number of questions that potential nominees will have to answer as they go through the vetting process and as they have a conversation with the President of the United States about whether or not they are the best person to fill the vacancy on the Supreme Court. I can tell you that um, what political party do you support will not be one of the questions. Uh, the President is interested in choosing the best person for the job regardless of politics. Uh, and uh, that's, what the, that's what the process will drive toward, and that certainly is uh, what the President is interested in, um, uh, in focusing on. This shouldn't be about politics. It certainly shouldn't be about partisan politics. This should be about fulfilling a constitutional duty to appoint someone to a lifetime appointment on the highest court in the land. And uh, you know, frankly, this is an issue that uh, has been increasingly politicized over the years. Uh, I understand that, and the President himself said that he understood that politics are going to continue to have some influence on this process, but we can't allow partisan politics to dominate this process in a way that prevents the President of the United States and the members of the United States Senate from fulfilling their constitutional duties. The President is determined to make sure that that doesn't happen when it comes to his constitutional duties. That's why the President will put forward a nominee. And it will be up to the Senate to decide whether or not they're going to choose partisan politics uh, over their constitutional duties. And right now, I think, uh, as you point out, the, uh, you know, I guess this is maybe a bad pun, but the jury's still out on that one. We'll have to see exactly what they choose to do. But it, it is about politics, and the, the President acknowledged as much in his remarks yesterday in the Oval Office when saying that it's, it's tough and he has sympathy for the Republicans because this could change the balance of power on the Supreme Court. Are you saying that he's not taking politics into, into account at all when thinking about the possibility of having a court that would have five liberal, liberal justices instead of five conservative justices? Uh, again, well, uh, I think it's like, yeah, well, listen, as I uh, acknowledged in my I answered your first question. Politics are going to be part of this, particularly in an election year. I don't think anybody disputes that. Well, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, the President has made clear he's not, he's not on the ballot. Uh, and the President's interested in fulfilling his constitutional duty to appoint the person that he believes uh, is the best person in America to fill the vacancy on the Supreme Court. And the President's not going to be asking that person who they voted for in the 2008 or the 2012 election. He's not going to be asking that person which party they're registered to vote in. Uh, the President's going to be asking them much more relevant questions about their legal qualifications and about their view of the law and about their, uh, 
belief in the importance of the rule of law? Those are the kinds of questions that the President will ask, and those are the kinds of questions that should take precedence, both in terms of who the President chooses to nominate, but those are also the kinds of questions that members of the United States Senate should be asking the nominee when that individual sits down for a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee. That, that's, that's how the, the, the choice should be made. It's certainly how the President will be making his decision. And look, the President also acknowledged yesterday in the Oval Office that the American people are going to have a view of this person. And I think most Americans are going to be interested in that person's legal views, understanding their commitment to public service, understanding their commitment to the rule of law, understanding exactly how they apply uh, their legal training and how it informs their judgment about a range of issues that are important and have an impact on the day-to-day -day lives of the American people. That's certainly how the American people will decide, and that's how they should. The question is, is are senators actually going to say, or how many senators at this point are going to say, look, I'd rather put my uh, partisan affiliation uh, ahead of my constitutional duty? That would be a, a rather unfortunate choice and an unprecedented escalation of partisanship of a branch of government that our founders intended to shield from partisan politics. All right, lastly, you, you mentioned um, the de debate tonight. Mm -hmm. um, if you were advising establishment Republicans mm -hmm. who are concerned about the prospect of Donald Trump as the Republican nominee, what would you advise them to do? Well, uh, fortunately for them, uh, they've got much more qualified people to uh, consult for advice than, than me. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the hand-wringing has become public. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I think what's clear is Republican voters are going to decide who they want to lead their party. Uh, and that will mean a, a, a fundamental question for um, the American people, uh, but also for leading Republicans about what kind of party they want to have. And I think what is true, the thing that has not worked, is to essentially have establishment Republicans try to adopt Trump-style rhetoric and prioritize Trump-style values to advance their campaigns. That hasn't played very well. That hasn't worked. And uh, I think the real question uh, that will be on display in the general election is whether or not the American people either want to support Mr. Trump uh, or somebody who won an election by parroting Mr. Trump's views, or do they want somebody on the Democratic side who's committed to building on the progress that our country has made over the last uh, seven years of the Obama administration? Uh, and uh, I guess the question that I posed at the top was a, a pretty direct and simple one, but uh, the one that uh, you're posing is a much more of an existential question for millions of Republicans. Michelle. Uh, back to this best person for the job, regardless mm -hmm. of politics. I mean, the President is considering this person based on their likelihood of confirmation, right? Well, the, the President is certainly aware that anybody that he chooses is somebody that will um, have to go through a confirmation process. Uh, that means it'll have to be somebody who is prepared to face the public spotlight, somebody who's, who's going to have to spend several hours answering tough questions under oath, on camera, before the American people, on a range of complicated uh, legal issues. Um, so this is going to require a rather unique individual with a, um, uh, with a good mix of qualifications uh, and cool under fire to, uh, uh, to win. Or to be to you know to essentially win the approval of the United States Senate, but look, that's true of anybody that's been appointed to the Supreme Court uh, in the last thirty or forty years. There have been lots of other tough Supreme Court fights too. Uh, both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan had to withstand days of testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. They certainly didn't get a lot of softballs, and they also had to intense. Uh, uh, they also had to withstand a lot of intense scrutiny from all of you. All of you did a lot of stories about Justice Sotomayor's uh, uh, tenure as a federal judge and spent a lot of time scrutinizing the arguments that then Solicitor General Kagan made before the Supreme Court. That's part of the process. We would expect 
uh, this to be a rigorous process. Uh, and the President certainly expects that whoever he nominates to this job uh, will be able to uh, engage in that rigorous process uh, and emerge from it having successfully described to the American people what their views are and why they actually are the best person for the job. But in a Republican Senate, many of whom are opposed to even bringing this person up for a hearing, the President has to consider politics to a large extent. I mean, how likely re these re same Republicans are going to even give this person consideration, right? I mean, let's just, can't we just say that goes without saying that he's going to have to consider that? Well, again, I, I guess I would say two things about this. The first is both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan, when they were put forward as nominees by the President, they were confirmed with Republican support. They both got Republican votes. So, and that was when Democrats were in the majority in the United States Senate. So the President has a track record of choosing highly qualified individuals that deserve bipartisan support. So that's always been part of the President's calculation here. Uh, that's always been part of the criteria. But some of that is also a, a function of the question that senators face when they are considering a nominee for the Supreme Court. Again, as I've mentioned, they're not supposed to base their vote solely on whether or not that person would have been their top pick to the Supreme Court. If they want to see their top pick, top pick ascend to the Supreme Court, then they should run for president. Because that is a, a job that the framers of our Constitution gave to the President of the United States. Some of them are, to be fair. Uh, but those who aren't uh, should be using criteria uh, to evaluate whether or not this person is qualified and can serve the country with honor and distinction uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, this is an important job, and it does merit the serious consideration of members of the United States Senate, uh, but it should not be uh, uh, clouded by a partisan political calculation. So to get um, a notification from Sandoval's office like that, that he's not interested in being considered, if he were to be considered, um, is the White House disappointed in that message? Uh, no, I don't think there's anybody that's disappointed in it. He's obviously uh, entitled to make decisions about his own career. And he, I don't really want to serve on the Supreme Court either. So it seems like a really important job. I'm not sure that I'm – yeah, there you go. Scratch me off the short list. The long list just got no, shorter. No earnest. <laughs> But look, I, I, but, uh, you, exactly. Expect, um, do you but, expect more of that potentially to come? I mean, do you expect fewer people to be interested in going through that process, which may or may not even happen? But you can imagine if somebody was up for hearings, then the process is going to be pretty tough this time around. Do you expect that to affect people's um, acceptance of consideration? I don't expect that it will. I, I think that people understand. Uh, I think that. The kinds of people who actually are interested in uh, a job like this and are interested in uh, serving on the Supreme Court uh, in a lifetime appointment, they understand that this is a rigorous process uh, and they understand what that entails. And uh, I think uh, it, it's certainly understandable that most people wouldn't want to go through it. Uh, but um, I think the kinds of people who have the kind of passion for the law that have the kind of extraordinary uh, intellectual and legal skills are the kinds of people who are going to perform well uh, in that difficult setting. So uh, I'm confident uh, that the President will be able to uh, find the right person to fill that vacancy uh, and that that person will be enthusiastic about the opportunity. And on this meeting Tuesday, uh, Mitch McConnell has already said that he's going to use that time to tell the President that he should wait until the next president is in office uh, for someone to be, be brought up. So what do you expect to come from this meeting? I mean, you've already mentioned that some of these conversations were kind of awkward to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I say awkward because I think that there were some uh, people who were uncomfortable with the position not attending the meeting. Uh, and so we obviously are gratified that they are uh, going to attend. And uh, that's an important part of the process. The president is determined to consult uh, with members of the Senate about his constitutional duty, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, there will be uh, participants in that meeting who recognize the constitutional duty that they have, too. Okay. Uh, Tolu. Do you expect the President to consult with the 2016 Democratic candidates 
as he already called Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders to talk about this fix. And, um, if this doesn't go through, they'd be next in line, potentially, if they want to, uh, to make the appointment. Look, I, I, at this point, I, I would not expect the President to consult with him specifically about uh, who he will choose. Um, again, this is, uh, this is not about politics. This is about the President fulfilling his constitutional duty. I mean, one of the interesting things here is obviously Senator Cruz is running for president, but yet he also has a responsibility to serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee. So um, some may consider that a little ironic, but he actually may be uh, at least the first uh, presidential candidate uh, who's consulted about this. But look, I guess on the other hand, you know, Senator Sanders continues to be a sitting member of the United States Senate. I'm confident the president's already consulted with a number of Democrats. Uh, but if, uh, if that kind of conversation occurred, it would be solely in uh, the context of Senator Sanders' um, current service in the United States Senate, uh, not because he's a presidential candidate. Also ask about the meeting at uh, the State Department today. Um, can you give a little bit of an update or preview what the president might say? Is this specifically about the cessation of hostilities? Um, what can we expect to hear from the president on, on that today? Yeah. Uh, this, the meeting that the president will convene with his national security team uh, today will occur at the State Department. and. Um, at the same time, uh, all of the members of the President's national security team, the senior members of his team, will be there. There will be a number of White House officials, but also uh, senior officials from the, the intel community, the Department of Defense, uh, the Treasury Department, and others that have a, a ro an important role in our counter-ISIL campaign. Uh, the reason that the, the, the meeting will take place at the State Department is obviously State Department officials have um, been intensely focused recently on trying to successfully implement uh, this understanding about a cessation of hostilities. Uh, that's required a lot of uh, diplomatic spade work, uh, and that work uh, has really just begun. Uh, it's going to require a lot of follow-through uh, uh, to implement this successfully, if it can be implemented successfully. Um, so that certainly will be an important part of the discussion, but uh, the meeting agenda will not just be limited to a discussion of the cessation of hostilities. Uh, there will be uh, the regular update that the President will get from his military advisors uh, about the ongoing military efforts uh, against uh, ISIL. Uh, there will be a continued discussion of our counterfinance efforts against ISIL. Uh, there will even be a discussion about um, uh, some of the work that the United States has been doing uh, to prevent ISIL from capitalizing on other areas where there is political turmoil and chaos. Um, Libya is probably the best example of that. But, so this will be a rather wide-ranging meeting, but it will all be focused on our ongoing effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Um, the President will speak to you after the meeting, and so you'll get a little more of a flavor of, uh, of what occurs there. They are potentially going to come up with a new operating system that would um, make it impossible for them to create this back door that there's this fight over right now. Um, could that be a potential? backfire of the, of the FBI sort of coming hard after Apple to get into uh, this phone in San Bernardino? Well, I, I, I have uh, very limited uh, actual knowledge and technical knowledge of what uh, Apple's future plans are. Um, uh, I know that uh, many people who work on technology issues um, uh, focus on the realm of the possible. Um, and. You know, at this point, you know, we've been pretty clear about what our position is in this specific case, um, but as it relates to Apple's um, broader plans, you'd have to talk to them about it. Finally, um, you mentioned the previous Republican nominee. Um, he said, I think, yesterday that there may be a bombshell in Donald Trump's tax, uh, taxes that haven't been released yet. Um, he didn't seem too happy when somebody said that about his tax returns, right, okay. as I recall. <laughs> Since the President did engage in sort of this back and forth on taxes with Mitt Romney. Um, does the President believe that Donald Trump needs to uh, yeah. release his taxes as soon as possible? Well, look, uh, to be clear, I wasn't making a, a reference to the President. I, I think the President has made uh, transparency a priority, and even as President, he has released uh, his tax returns every year, and he certainly did, uh, did so as a candidate. Uh, and it wasn't just his current tax returns, it was his, um, you know, a number of previous years as well. I, I don't recall the exact number off the top of my head. Uh, but that's, I think, what the expectation. I think the American people have the expectation that that's what the candidates uh, will do. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I'm not here to issue challenges about what uh, one candidate should or should not do. Uh, each of them will have to uh, decide on their own 
uh, what they believe is the most appropriate way to um, uh, you know, provide that kind of information to the American public. Okay, Ron. Just to clarify, the, the statement that the, um, the president's going to make about the TEP to be meeting, the, the, is that going to be essentially a summarization of what he what happened, or is this some, some sort of announcement about something new, uh, a new policy, a new proposal, a new initiative? Yeah. I, I wouldn't expect a major new announcement today. Uh, I think it will be an opportunity, though, for uh, once the president has received an update from his team about the progress that we've made against ISIL, uh, he'll share a version of that update with the American people, uh, and that's that will be the uh, intent of the president's remarks today. I it, would, it would parallel what we heard the other day from um, yeah, well, uh, Brett was obviously focused on um, uh, on the uh, on much of the military campaign on the ground in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, I think there will be some other elements uh, that will be covered in the meeting, including an update on our counter uh, finance uh, efforts. Some of the diplomatic work around a cessation of hostilities will obviously be covered, and uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out discussion about uh, ISIL's effort to uh, gain a, f a foothold in Libya as well. Obviously, uh, the United States military took a, a pretty significant airstrike. Uh, earlier this week uh, that, um, uh, that targeted a uh, leading ISIL figure uh, in Libya. Uh, that's not the first strike that we've taken there. But anyway, the, the conversation will be somewhat broader than the presentation that Brett made earlier this week. Uh, on the Supreme Court uh, meeting, uh, reaching out to the members of the Judiciary Committee, <coughs> um, the President didn't make any of those calls, or did he? No, the President made many of those calls, uh, not all of them. So he spoke to someone in each uh, each member's office? Did he speak to any members directly? Uh, no. Um, maybe we're talking past each other. Someone from the White House has contacted every single office uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Right. Many right. of those calls were made by the President of the United States to members. Uh, the President did not call any staff. Right. So any okay. staff level contacts occurred um, from White House staffers to Senate staffers. Um, can you say how many members he spoke to? He spoke to all of them? Uh, no, the President did not speak to all of, uh, members in all of the offices, but many of them. Uh, he did speak to both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I, I don't have the specific numbers here, um, but, uh, but the President uh, convened uh, uh, many calls with Democrats and Republicans on the Judiciary Committee. And can you say these are intensive consultations? Are, are names exchanged? Well, I, I don't have a... What do you mean by, you know, this beyond just saying, you know, do your yeah. job, I'll do my job, and... Yeah. Constitution. Yeah. When you say intensive, what can you give some indication of what? Yeah. Well, again, I, I think it depends on the person and on the view of uh, the person on the other end of the phone. Well, in the best possible circumstances. What well, yeah. I look, intensive. I mean, as I've noted earlier, there are some people who are, have publicly and privately said that they're not going to consider anybody. So it's hard to have a detailed conversation about who the president's considering if they've already said it doesn't matter who you choose, I'm going to oppose them. Uh, unfortunately, that's the approach that's been taken by a large number of Republicans, and that's unfortunate. But is that the but, response he got from some of the members he spoke to? Did they just tell him, look, we're not going to deal with this? Well, again, I, you'd have to ask them about what they conveyed to the President of the United States. But uh, the President's been pretty clear about his commitment to doing uh, his job, and he expects them to, uh, to do theirs as well. Uh, but in some cases, there was a discussion about how the President would make this decision, about what kind of criteria that he would use. Uh, in some cases, there was a discussion about what that process uh, would look like and what it should look like. Um, but, you know, again, th those conversations were a lot more fruitful uh, with people who um, weren't refusing to do their job. Is there ever a sharing of names? Would you say that, um, could you say for certain that at some point the President will actually discuss nominees with um, members of the committee? Well, again, I, I, I um, those. It certainly isn't off limits for, uh, or somehow inappropriate for members of Congress to say to the President, hey, I really like this person, you should consider them. Uh, that's not an inappropriate thing for them to say, particularly if there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, particularly if they're a member of the Judiciary Committee, and particularly if they recognize that the President has a constitutional duty to name someone to fill that vacancy. So that certainly is an appropriate uh, thing to do. Um, but you'd have to ask members of Congress if they did that. One last thing. In, in the uh, session this morning about precision medicine, um, mm -hmm. the President said something about he, we just had a meeting about Zika, um, and there's some promising uh, news about vaccines or so. Was he referring to something that had just happened very recently that we're not aware of, or was he just using the, 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 um, 
the, the term war yeah. generally? I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to. I know that the president did obviously convene a meeting that you do know about uh, that occurred in the Situation Room about three or four weeks ago, where the president met with uh, uh, his uh, members of his national security team, but also his top uh, science and health advisors uh, to discuss this issue. I know the president is regularly updated on the efforts of uh, his team to prepare for uh, the Zika virus. So I don't know if he was referring to that m formal meeting that he had back at the end of January, or if he was referring to one of the uh, many updates that he's received in that period of time. He sounded generally positive about um, a promising pathway for vaccines, and the virus is not as complicated as we think. Maybe he was talking, uh, obviously, as a layman, but um, mm -hmm. it, it sounded like he was referring to something that had happened post that. Uh, uh, we'll see if we can look into this and get you some more specific information about what the president was referring to. Okay. Mark. Josh, on Tuesday's meeting, would you say it is the principal objective of President Obama to persuade McConnell and Grassley to go up to launch a confirmation process? Mm -hmm. I think the principal objective is for the president to share his views about why he believes his constitutional duty to nominate someone to fill a Supreme Court vacancy is so important. And I think he intends to uh, try to help those members of uh, the Senate and the Judiciary Committee understand exactly how he will make this decision. Um, I, I suspect that some of them will have questions for him. He'll answer those questions. Uh, but look, ultimately, Senator Grassley and, uh, and uh, Senator McConnell and the rest of the Senate Judiciary Committee on the Republican side and the rest of the Republican caucus is going to have to decide for themselves whether or not they're going to fulfill their constitutional duty. We've seen a couple of them come forward and say that that's what they, exactly what they intend to do. Both Senator Collins and Senator Kirk uh, have indicated that that's uh, what they intend to do. Um, you know, there's some others that have had uh, a couple different positions uh, on this issue. Uh, but ultimately, the president uh, is going to uh, fulfill his duty, and it'll be up to the Senate to decide uh, if, they're, uh, if they're going to fill theirs. But McConnell has already said he's not going to accept a, a nominee from this president. Mm -hmm. So the whole process becomes moot if there's not going to be a confirmation process. Well, uh, Mark, I, I don't think so that's true. That the, the number one thing that the president needs to address with them mm -hmm. to get them to see that uh, they're obligated to do otherwise in his view. Look, ult ultimately, obviously that's what the president would like them to do. But we're realistic that that's a conclusion that they're going to arrive at on their own. They're going to have to decide. I suspect some of them will consult with their constituents about it. Uh, some of them will spend a little time uh, thinking about what their responsibilities are. But look, when, if you're talking about members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, these are individuals who are conversant in what the Constitution requires. Uh, many of them have served uh, on that committee or in the United States Senate for a long period of time. In fact, both Senator McConnell and Senator Grassley can remember when they personally voted to confirm a nominee in a presidential election year in 1988. So they understand the history here. They understand the responsibility that they have. But ultimately, they'll have to make up uh, their own mind. I, I don't think that um, uh, the president's going to be in a position of twisting arms. This ultimately is a, a decision that, uh, that these Republican senators will have to make on their own. Why would you say that? that he wouldn't want to be in a position of twisting arms. Yeah. Isn't that what he needs to do? Well, again, I think he will certainly make a strong case about his commitment to fulfilling his constitutional duty. He will urge them to fulfill theirs. Uh, but it's not as if the president's going to present um, to them uh, some part of the Constitution that they haven't read before. Um, they understand exactly what their responsibilities are. These are guys that have served in the Senate for decades. They've got decades of experience of dealing with this stuff. Uh, and again, you know, when it comes to uh, Senators Hatch and Senator Grassley and Senator McConnell, the last time that there was a, uh, a vacancy on the Supreme Court in a presidential election year, they voted to confirm the president's nominee. Uh, we, we're just asking them to do the same thing this time. And let me ask about your slideshow. Mm -hmm. um, we can get you copies. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Uh, is it. Did you do this because you believe the president's economic record is being unfairly criticized by Republican candidates? No, I actually I did it because I uh, the president is taking a, uh, is making a visit to Jacksonville, Florida tomorrow. Right. Uh, he'll be visiting uh, an advanced battery facility uh, that benefited from the Recovery Act, uh, and this is a facility that uh, now employs about 300 people in the Jacksonville area, including a bunch of veterans. 
Uh, he'll be talking about the important uh, progress that they've made in developing their product and some of the uh, potential applications for that product uh, down the line. Uh, so there's an interesting story to tell about the President's travel, but I figured I could make that presentation that I'm sure you all thought was riveting even more interesting by discussing its relevance to tonight's festivities. Well, you would agree that your um, economic uh, selections were uh, uh, certainly chosen to, to put the best point of view on the President's uh, economic record. I, I didn't see a slide about wages or taxes or the debt. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think, uh, well, when it comes to taxes, uh, there are, um, you know, I think there are 20 or so taxes that have been cut by the Obama administration when it comes to small businesses. Uh, taxes haven't gone up for people making less than $400,000 a year or so. So middle class families actually now have permanent tax cuts that were made permanent uh, in the Obama ad administration. Maybe you ought um, to do a tax slide. So maybe we should. That's a, a good idea. I, maybe, maybe you and I should have consulted before I did the presentation tonight. You got my number. Uh, I do. Uh, but I do think that, uh, and again, we'll get you copies of the slides, but when you, you know, whether it's the housing market, household wealth, the auto industry, health care costs, uh, the unemployment rate, comparison to other countries, this is a pretty wide net that we cast here. Uh, and I think all of that serves to illustrate that there are um, a lot of metrics uh, that demonstrate how much progress this country has made over the last seven years, which makes it, frankly, pretty easy to answer the question that the United States actually is better off uh, than they were seven years ago. Um, we'll see if uh, We'll see how Republican candidates choose to handle that tonight. Okay. okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Speaking of uh, taxes and TPP, you mm -hmm. mentioned previously how uh, with that you would be able yeah. to cut a number of business taxes. Yeah. That tax slide would be a lot better you know, if we could finish that one, huh? 18000 would be a big number. There you go. Um, uh, what's the latest on the canvassing? I imagine that's ongoing from your mm -hmm. perspective. And I'm curious about how concerned are you that as that continues to sort of unpack itself, Given the rancor sometimes between the White House and the Hill, uh, how worried are you that this will eventually move forward? Yeah. Well, Kevin, there was a lot of discussion at the end of last year, uh, maybe, I guess actually at the end of 2014, uh, uh, among Republicans who vehemently disagreed with the President's decision to move forward with executive actions on immigration reform. And Republicans were threatening at the time that if the President moved forward on executive actions on immigration reform, that that would poison the well and that Republicans would refuse to cooperate with the administration again. And the case that the President made was that uh, Republicans shouldn't let a difference of opinion over one issue become a deal breaker over all the others. Uh, and that approach is one that Republicans uh, largely did adopt. And it's why there was so much that we, we were able to accomplish at the end of last year. And we're hopeful that uh, Republicans would pursue that approach uh, with regard to the Supreme Court and the Trans-Pacific Partnership as well. We, right now at least, have a pretty vigorous disagreement about whether or not the Senate Republicans should fulfill their constitutional duty. They don't think they should. Uh, but we shouldn't allow the disagreement over that to prevent us from um, making progress in areas where we do agree. And for all of our differences over the Supreme Court, uh, Senator McConnell is somebody who has, uh, who shares the President's view that uh, ratifying the Trans-Pacific Partnership, allowing it to go into effect, and allowing it to cut taxes on 18,000 taxes that are imposed by other countries on American goods would be good for the U.S. economy. Uh, Leader McConnell and President Obama agree on that, and um, uh, so hopefully the, uh, the Senate will, uh, will take action on that. I, I will point out, uh, which is also uh, absolutely true, we'll need bipartisan support for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it's not just Republicans that will be making the case to. You know, we're going to continue to uh, make the case to Democrats, um, and uh, we've got a pretty strong case to make. Going uh, over soon? Well, uh, at this point, you know, there's still some work uh, to be done. Uh, there's still a period of, uh, uh, of public review that, that's ongoing right now. Right. Uh, but I don't have an update for you in terms of when this will be uh, presented to Capitol Hill. So nothing uh, imminent. Uh, let me ask you about uh, the Iranians. About six weeks ago, um, there was the prisoner swap that we all talked a great deal about, and yet it would appear that they're back at it again, uh, arresting Americans, a former UNICEF official has been arrested by the Iranians. Are you aware of this report? And uh, if so, uh, what is your reaction to that? Uh, I've seen some of these reports, but for, uh, for privacy reasons, I, uh, I, I can't get into it from here. You can't get into the fact that you're aware that it's happened, or is there a negotiation to try to uh, somehow work out a release of this individual? I think Secretary Kerry acknowledged uh, that this is something that he's focused on, and he's been engaged uh, on this issue. But 
Again, because of uh, privacy considerations, I'm not in a position to discuss it from here. Okay, and lastly, I want to ask you also about uh, the process on Tuesday. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but are we talking about flip charts and, and, and names across the board, not this one, not that one? Is that sort of how the process works itself out when you have this conversation? Yeah. No, I, I don't think it will go, go like that, uh, in part because there are at least two people who will be sitting in the meeting who say that it doesn't matter what name you write on the board, we're going to oppose them. Again, I, that's not consistent with the constitutional duties that Republicans have and the Democrats have, frankly, too. Um, so, again, I, I'm not sure that there will be an extensive, detailed discussion of particular nominees, uh, at least until such time uh, as uh, Republicans move off their position of saying that there's nobody that they can accept. Um, but uh, I do think the President wants to have a serious discussion about his constitutional duty, about their constitutional duty, about the criteria that he will use to evaluate potential nominees, uh, and to discuss what the process for moving forward should look like. I forgot. This afternoon when the President speaks, and I know you don't want to sort of, you know, preview what's going to happen in the meeting, uh, the counter-ISIL strategy, are you still satisfied that even within the last, say, several months, with all the adjustments, that it's going in the right direction? Or is that over-reading where we are right now in counter ISIL strategy? Yeah, no, there's no denying that this is moving in the right direction. And I think uh, Brett McGurk made a pretty powerful presentation about why that's the case um, at, tu at Tuesday's briefing. Uh, we've made important progress in taking back territory uh, from ISIL. Uh, there, uh, you know, is, is ongoing uh, a pretty aggressive fight around uh, Shadadi uh, in Syria right now, which is just outside Raqqa. Um, if that uh, if that effort uh, yield success and we are able to make some additional gains there, uh, that would have the uh, effect of essentially you know, separating uh, ISIL in, er in Iraq uh, and ISIL's headquarters uh, in Syria. And that would be sort of the next phase of, of this strategy. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, we, sir we still are keenly aware of how significant uh, the threat that uh, – uh, how significant the threat is that ISIL poses. Uh, but there's no denying that, you know, whether you look at the last 18 months or the last nine months or even the last six months, we've made a lot of important progress in that, uh, in that fight. Okay. Byron. Thanks, Josh. Um, you mentioned in your slide presentation that uh, unemployment falling below 5 percent is one of the administration's main economic accomplishments. Mm -hmm. uh, but Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders has made it a frequent campaign trail talking point that the real unemployment rate is above 10 percent because of labor force dropouts. Um, does the White House agree with that economic theory that, that real unemployment is above or above 10 percent? And if yes, do you bear any responsibility for that, the state of uh, real unemployment and the number of labor force dropouts? Uh, Byron, I think the point is simply this. Uh, we've made uh, a lot of important progress in the last seven years. Uh, and part of that progress can be measured by the way that the unemployment rate has been cut by more than half from its uh, high of around 10 percent to now below 5 percent. Uh, that is uh, undeniable progress that some Republicans will continue to deny. What's also true, and I think this is the point that Senator Sanders is making, is that we can't let up. We need to continue to be focused on making sure that we're expanding economic opportunity for the middle class and that we're making the kinds of investments that are going to benefit future generations of American workers. Uh, and again, unfortunately, uh, uh, well, and so that means, as the President has said, doing things like raising the minimum wage uh, and investing in early childhood education and offering two uh, years of community college education to uh, students that are willing to work hard for it. Um, unfortunately, Republicans, um, while some recognize that more work needs to be done, have exactly the wrong prescription. They actually want to go back to the policies that led to the Great Recession in the first place. They just want to go back to uh, cutting taxes for the wealthy and for wealthy corporations. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and it certainly is a, a vision that is not consistent with what President Obama has fought for uh, for the last uh, seven years. And it's not consistent with the kind of vision that's being articulated by Democrats out on the campaign trail. When Senator Sanders says that on the campaign trail, um, does the White view that as a critique or a sort of a dig at its economic record? No, I, I think, again, the way that I interpret it, at least, is that Senator Sanders is making the case that the next president is going to have to build on the progress that we have made over the last seven years. And that's why Senator Sanders can often be heard saying things like, we need to invest in early childhood education. We need to raise the minimum wage. 
we need to do more to expand economic opportunity for everybody in the middle class and not, and, and for everybody that's trying to working hard to try to get into the middle class. That's the kind of rhetoric that you hear from Senator Sanders, and that's exactly what President Obama has been fighting for the last seven years. We've made important progress on that scale, uh, but we can't let up. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Republicans have a, a starkly different vision for uh, where to take the country and our economic policy. Uh, and that's why the, the stakes of the presidential election in 2016, when we get around to the general election, will be quite high. Okay. Dave. The President had the event this morning about precision, precision medicine, mm -hmm. um, and of course that involves as many as a million people donating their genetic information to go into a large database for medical research. Um, and the President spoke of the need for strong privacy protections in, in this program. Given the high-profile breaches, that cyber attacks on OPM and other government agencies in the last year, how can the administration assure people that their personal genetic information isn't going to fall into the wrong hands? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Dave, I think primarily because this is uh, something we've made clear from the beginning is a top priority. And we're certainly going to work with the private sector, uh, but also use the best government experts uh, to make sure that this data is, uh, is protected uh, and that it is secure and that it can be used for the uh, scientific purposes that are intended. Um, I don't have a good sense about sort of what kinds of uh, vulnerabilities uh, would exist uh, or may exist out there. But fortunately, we've got experts who are very focused on this, understand that this is a top presidential priority, uh, and they're very focused on it. Can you guarantee people that their information won't be stolen? I can guarantee people that this is a top priority and that the, that the focus on uh, cybersecurity and protecting this private information uh, will remain paramount. Okay. Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Just going back to Syria, Josh, um, you mentioned you noted the progress made in Shadada and that Shadada is quite close to Raqqa. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, will Raqqa be taken, retaken before the President leaves office? Uh, I, I don't have a sense of, uh, of that timing. Um, the Department of Defense uh, probably does have a, a better sense of that timing, but I don't think that's something they're going to be prepared to talk about publicly. Uh, they, uh, I think for understandable operational reasons, uh, those kinds of, uh, of plans will uh, uh, be kept private. Uh, but, uh, you know, you've heard from our uh, military commanders that they believe that that is a, uh, uh, that certainly is a goal that they have. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we're making some progress against that goal, uh, even right now, as the fighting is, uh, is ongoing in Shadadi. Um, <coughs> another Syria-related issue, Secretary Kerry said that, um, that the administration has seen a reduction in Iranian Revolutionary Guard numbers in Syria. I was wondering if you, if that's the sense from here and why that might be. I haven't gotten a sense of, uh, of that assessment, so let me take that question and see if I can provide you some more, some more details about that. Okay. Margaret. Josh, also on Syria, um, Vladimir Putin appears to be at least trying to look like he's taking a very personal role in this cessation of hostilities if he's not actually. I mean, even your own release said the other day that it was at the Kremlin's urging that this phone call happened with President Obama. So with the President going to the State Department today, is there some thought to trying to make this look like a parallel here that the President himself is also as involved? Uh, no, uh, I, there's not. I, I think the first thing that is true is that this kind of cessation of hostilities uh, understanding uh, would not be possible without the dogged tenacity uh, of the of America's top diplomat, John Kerry. And he deserves a lot of credit for uh, cobbling together the wide variety of parties that are involved here. Uh, and that is a reflection uh, of American leadership. What, what is also true is that Russia and President Putin personally have a lot of skin in the game. And they're on the hook for making sure that this understanding is successfully implemented. And there will be bumps in the road. Uh, there will be setbacks. There will be early indications that it's not taking hold as intended. But Russia is going to be on the hook for playing their part uh, and making sure that, um, that the parties that they are in regular communication with and that they have influence over uh, are abiding by the uh, understanding. Uh, so uh, we certainly welcome the prominence that President Putin has attached to this because Russia's got a lot riding on it. Um, but 
with that, are you saying that this kind of picking up the phone, calling, you know, immediacy that Putin tries to be projecting here uh, is not something that's appropriate for the United States, that this should stay uh, at Kerry's level and not be elevated to the White House? Well, obviously, the, the President is regularly updated on this situation. Obviously, the President's consulting with his counterparts in other countries, including in Russia, uh, about this. But this is a, a diplomatic effort that has been painstaking, and it's a testament to um, Secretary Kerry's skills and patience. Uh, but Secretary Kerry understands that the stakes are high. There are millions of lives that are riding on the line. Uh, and I think that would explain uh, the passion that he has for this. But Russia's on the hook. And this is, a, I, I think, let me, let me try to put it this way um, to you, Margaret. I think our bigger concern would be if before the ceasefire is even implemented, Russia looked like they were backing away. If President Putin was trying to act like he didn't want to talk to anybody, that'd be a bigger problem. Because that would be an indication that Russia doesn't quite understand that they've got a lot riding on the successful implementation of this understanding. But in fact, they do understand that they have a lot riding on it. And we certainly uh, are pleased that they are uh, aware of the high stakes here. Uh, and you know, as we, again, in the days and weeks ahead, uh, Russia's got, a, uh, got some significant responsibilities. If you take a step back, I mean, this is a president who has won the Nobel Peace Prize. So given that, and given the focus that the administration says it has rhetorically on diplomacy here and the importance of this, mm -hmm. um, why is it not more important to the administration to elevate Syria that has an issue? What, is the president feeling like he has some skin in the game when it comes to this? Well, again. He certainly takes a lot of flack, as you know, from yeah. critics about yeah. where the state of the conflict is and yeah. whether he should have acted earlier or not. Yeah. Well, I, I think that it is true on a variety of issues that um, President Putin is far more interested in claiming personal credit for things uh, than President Obama is. Um, maybe there's some armchair psychology, be, psychology to be done there. Uh, but I think that this president is uh, less focused on his self-image uh, and much more focused on advancing U.S. interests around the world and keeping the American people safe. That is, after all, why the United States has done the hard work of organizing an international coalition of 65 or 66 countries to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And again, as I was saying before, that what sort of fits my little uh, vision or view of the situation is that Russia has chose, chosen to stand apart and take unilateral action separate from our counter-ISIL coalition. I'm not really sure why that is. But the President believes that U.S. interests are at best advanced by building that kind of uh, large coalition. Uh, I think that's just one illustrative example. I guess the other thing that I'll say is, you know, this has been going on for a long time, as you've closely covered. Since the beginning, the United States has insisted that a military solution cannot be imposed on Syria, that the root of this problem that has caused so much chaos and violence and uh, innocent loss of life is is that a military solution can't be imposed on it. And that's, that's something that we've long understood. And that's why even when military action is required to degrade ISIL, even when military action is required to uh, exploit uh, available intelligence, even when military action is required to prevent an attack on American interests or our allies or even the United States, the President won't hesitate to do that. But we know that the core of solving this problem involves bringing about a long overdue political transition inside of Syria. Um, perhaps also difficult, but maybe less murky. Mm -hmm. um, Gitmo, uh, mm -hmm. does the White House believe that the President does have constitutional authority to override the, the ban on transfers of prisoners to the U.S. mainland? The, our position on this uh, has been pretty clear since the President articulated it at the, uh, uh, in mid-December last year where he said that our, the focus of our administration uh, is on working with Congress to get them to remove the obstacles that prevent us from closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay. And what was included in that plan was a very specific proposal for how we could take steps that were consistent with the military advice that the President's receiving, 
that was consistent with the need to cut wasteful spending, that was consistent with the need to remove a symbol that we know terrorist organizations use to recruit followers. That's the plan that we've put forward, and we want Congress to remove the obstacles that prevent that plan from being successfully implemented. That continues to be the focal point of our efforts right so that now. That means the White House Counsel's Office has concluded that the President does not have constitutional authority to override that law. Uh, I, Is I, that correct? I, 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 I haven't been briefed on any uh, legal conclusions that have been arrived at by uh, the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, what I know is that the whole reason we put together a plan and presented it to Congress on the time frame that they asked for is because they asked for that plan, and we had the fleeting hope that that plan would actually be considered on its merits and that we might be able to work in bipartisan fashion to get Congress to remove the obstacles that they've instituted that have prevented the prison from being closed in the first place. Um, you know, having a uh, it's still unclear whether or not that's actually going to happen. We certainly have seen that plan uh, be rejected basically before any of them read it, uh, before some members even read it. Uh, that was not encouraging, uh, but conversations on this issue uh, and on this topic still uh, continue, and I, I would expect they will in the days and weeks ahead. Well, the reason I asked is because uh, Attorney General Lynch was on the Hill today, and she was specifically asked whether a new law would have to be written before prisoners were transferred, and rather than answering the question, she said she didn't want to get ahead of the White House, which would appear that this is actually something the White House is looking at and deciding on or at least deliberating about. Well, I think what is true is that the White House is most focused right now on getting Congress to remove those obstacles. And you know, does that require them writing a new law or amending a law that they previously passed? You know, we, we get somebody from Ledge Affairs up here to try to uh, figure that out for you. All I know is that our focus is on trying to get Congress to remove those obstacles so that we can implement this common sense plan that will make America uh, safer, that will save taxpayer dollars, and is consistent with the advice that the President's receiving from the leadership at the Pentagon. Okay. John. Vice President Biden's attending the Academy Awards on Sunday night, um, coming at a time I saw that. It's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. It's coming at a time when uh, many actors are uh, planning to boycott uh, the award show. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they perceive a lack of minority nominees um, there on the list. Yeah. I know the President's spoken out about this a little bit in the past, um, but does Vice President Biden's attendance at this event, does it at all undercut uh, the White House's message that they're standing behind these actors that are protesting, or mm -hmm. what's your, your take on that? Well, uh, Vice President Biden's going to the, to the Academy Awards for primarily for one reason, which is to raise awareness about which, uh, on an, a, a a raise awareness of an issue about which he is quite passionate, uh, and that's stopping sexual assault. Uh, and the Vice President is playing a leading role in the It's On Us campaign. And one of the songs that has been nominated for an Academy Award is a song that was written and performed by Lady Gaga. Uh, and it was included in a documentary that chronicles the uh, plague of sexual assaults on college campuses all across America. And the Vice President uh, uh, has done a lot of important work uh, in leading uh, the effort to end violence against women uh, and to end sexual assault. Uh, and this is an opportunity for him to uh, stand at a rather high-profile podium when millions of people across the country and around the world will be watching. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, the Vice President's passion for this issue will be uh, evident uh, once again uh, on Sunday night. Are there any plans to address the other issue, though, the lack of minorities that are nominated for this award show? Uh, my understanding is that his appearance is relatively brief uh, and will thus be, you know, be focused on uh, this issue that, uh, on which he's got quite a long track record. And then, um, earlier uh, this morning, when the President was walking back from next door, uh, I believe he was walking with Senator Alexander, mm -hmm. and I wondered um, if you have any sense whether the President gave uh, Alexander, who is perceived as a moderate Republican, moderate conservative, is he delivering any sort of message to the Republican conference, uh, the Senate conference? Um, did they discuss any sort of nominees? Is he, as a moderate himself, under consideration? I know he's not under judiciary <laughs> committee or anything, but yeah. what did that conversation, uh, did it continue in the West Wing when they came back? I haven't gotten a readout uh, of that conversation. I know the President was hoping to visit with Senator Alexander when he was at the White House today. I don't have the details of that conversation at this point, but if we can get more information about their conversation, we'll share it with you. And then finally, um, talking about Sandoval uh, taking himself out of consideration, are you aware of any other candidates? I know you can't name anybody, but are you aware of anybody else taking himself out this early on? Uh, other than me? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any other statements like that. Okay. Uh, John. Thanks a lot, John. It's been a difficult week for the President. Uh, 
submitted its proposal to close down Guantanamo this week, and that plan seems to be going nowhere. Uh, in addition to that, the President continues his efforts to fill this vacant seat on the Supreme Court, and based upon uh, the statements by the Senate Majority Leader, the letter um, that was signed by all members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, which opposes the idea of even a hearing for the nominee, that effort also seems to be going nowhere. On these two particular issues, does the President this week feel like a lame duck? Mm -hmm. He does not. Uh, I think the thing that's really taken a beating this week is the public perception of Republican, Senate Republicans' work ethic. Uh, you, know, you listed two examples of where Republicans are basically saying, we're not going to do our job. We're not even going to consider the administration's efforts to do its job, to keep the American people safe, and to perform a basic constitutional duty, which is to nominate someone to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. There are other examples, of course. You know, the other thing that happened just a couple of weeks ago, we saw Republicans come out even before the President had rolled out his budget and say that for the first time in 40 years, the budget committees were not actually going to allow the President's budget director to testify about the budget. So essentially, you had Republicans rejecting the President's budget before it was even announced. They said they wouldn't even consider it. It makes it all the more ironic that House Republicans have now had to postpone their plans about drawing up their own budget. That may be an indication of some deeper problems uh, that they have. You know, we saw an interesting story that, uh, that ran uh, in the New York Times this week about how Senator Shelby and Republicans on the Senate Banking Committee have not advanced a single administration nominee since the beginning of the Congress. And when asked why that was the case, when asked why he wasn't doing his job, ironically enough, Senator Shelby said it was because he had an upcoming primary. We'll see how he does in the primary. But there are consequences for him not doing his job. We've talked about Adam Zubin many times. This is the individual who will be responsible for implementing the kinds of sanctions against North Korea that the United Nations is considering right now. Uh, there's no reason uh, for uh, him to be the victim of such partisan obstruction. There are also nominees to the Export-Import Bank, to the SEC, and to the Federal Reserve that have not been considered by the Senate Banking Committee and have not been advanced by the Senate Banking Committee because Senator Shelby and other Republicans on the committee refuse to do their job. Uh, so uh, there is a track record here that's problematic for Republicans because they're in the majority. They spent years fighting tooth and nail, raising millions of dollars from special interests in Washington, D.C. and around the country to fund campaigns so that they could take over the majority in the United States Senate. Now they have the majority, and like the dog that caught the car, they're not really sure what they're supposed to do, even when the Constitution specifically describes what they should do, they're unwilling to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I've raised this issue earlier because I think this, um, again, they'll be getting their political advice from uh, people other than me. But I, I think this, is, this could be in the category of nonpartisan advice. Democratic voters and Republican voters uh, elect people to represent them in Washington, uh, and they expect those representatives to do their job. Uh, and this week, there's not much evidence to point to that Republicans are doing their job. There's plenty of evidence to point to that they're not doing their job. They're not willing to consider any nominee that the President puts forward to fill a vacancy in the Supreme Court. They're not willing to even consider a plan that they asked for from the administration that was provided by the Department of Defense about keeping the American people safe and closing the prison of Guantanamo Bay. They're not willing to consider a single uh, Obama nominee in the Senate Banking Committee, even when those nominees have uh, important nonpartisan responsibilities like imposing sanctions against Russia and North Korea uh, and ensuring the stability and safety of our uh, financial system. So, uh, you know, Republicans will have to speak to this at some point, or better yet, they'll just have to change their strategy. Doesn't mean they have to give them, I mean, look, this is the other thing. I know Republicans like to make the case that, well, they disagree with the president. That's okay. You're allowed to disagree with the president, of course. That's why you're in a different party. In some ways, Republicans would say that's part of the reason they're in the majority is because they campaigned on disagreeing with the president. But I would be surprised if they campaigned on not doing anything when they got here. They haven't done anything. And there's no reason that the kinds of issues that we're talking about have to be partisan. They surely don't. In fact, the framers of our Constitution were counting on the, the, the White House and the Senate 
to be able to put aside partisan politics and focus on the best interests of the country. And that system, again, there have been some bumps, there have been some inefficiencies, but that's worked even during President Obama's presidency. He's put forward two Supreme Court justices to fill vacancies there. Both of them have, have earned uh, Republican support in the Senate because these are individuals that had unquestioned credentials uh, and demonstrated a capacity to serve the American people with honor and distinction in a lifetime uh, appointment on the Supreme Court. So it's possible. There's a path out of this mess, uh, but it will require, and in fact, it will start uh, with Republican senators embracing the responsibility that they have to do their job. The president in the last two weeks has said that he regrets working to filibuster the nomination of Samuel Alito uh, when his nomination was up before the Senate. I had never heard him say that before. And I'm a journalist. I'm a cynic by nature. It <coughs> seems to me that it's convenient to talk about regret now when he hasn't mentioned it any time over the course of the past 10 years. H how would you explain that? Well, I think the first thing that I would explain is that the situation is different. Uh, that when the president uh, cast his vote to filibuster uh, President Bush's nominee, the president was pretty uh, direct about having given uh, Mr. Alito, uh, uh, Justice Alito, a fair hearing. Uh, and the President made clear that he had substantive objections to, uh, to Mr. Alito uh, ascending to uh, the mention becoming Justice Alito. So uh, Republicans, however, are not taking that same kind of approach. They're actually saying uh, there's no one that we will support. The second thing is this. Uh, the President made those statements and cast that vote after it was already clear that Justice Alito had the support that he needed to ascend to the bench. And uh, that's not what Republicans are proposing to do. What Republicans are proposing to do is to prevent the institution of the United States Senate from functioning. Uh, and that's, uh, that's why what the President uh, uh, did at the time was quite different. But look, I also think the President's being pretty blunt about the fact that uh, if he could have done it differently, uh, he would have rooted his objections uh, more in those substantive concerns that he had uh, with, uh, with Justice uh, Alito. But that didn't change the outcome. Is it difficult to get Republicans, in your view, to see the President's point of view when you have this video out there of then-Senator Biden <coughs> and Senator Schumer and Senator Reid Mm -hmm. essentially advocating the exact uh, procedures that Republicans are carrying forward right now. Mm -hmm. Is that difficult? Well, look, I, the part, it depends on the part of the video that you want to watch. Uh, when it comes to uh, Vice President Biden, uh, he stood on the floor of the United States Senate in the same video that you're citing and said, Mr. President, if the President consults and cooperates with the Senate or moderates his selections absent consultation, then his nominees may enjoy my support, as did Justices Kennedy and Souter. Uh, we're basically suggesting that Republicans in the Senate in 2016 should do precisely what Senator Biden and Chairman of the Judiciary Committee Biden did throughout his career. When you take a look at his record on the Judiciary Committee and his willingness to put his constitutional duty ahead of partisan politics, his record's hard to beat. I'm not sure that anybody can do it. He presided over the hearings that allowed uh, Justice Thomas uh, to move to the floor of the United States Senate, even though Senator Biden had his own personal objection to uh, Justice Thomas's nomination. Uh, that re represents him taking quite seriously his responsibility as chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, when Justice uh, Kennedy was uh, up for a vote, confirmation vote in a presidential election year, Democrats were in the majority. Joe Biden was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Justice Kennedy was nominated by a Republican president. The situation is the same. And yet, Senate Democrats actually moved to support Justice Kennedy, even though it was an election year, even though it was President Reagan's last year in office. We're asking Republicans this time around to do exactly the same thing. And the video of Senator Schumer and the video of Senator Reid, mm -hmm. how do you explain that away? Uh, I, I didn't see uh, uh, their particular comments. I mean, there are obviously a, a bunch of comments from uh, Republicans on the other side of, uh, uh, of this issue, too. So. I think, as I observed with uh, Gardner in a previous uh, briefing here, we could sort of throw you know old uh, old quotes back and forth, and um, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. I do think there's something inherently wrong, though, with Republicans refusing to fulfill their constitutional duty. Okay, Jared, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Um, you said the American people are going to have a view 
of the Supreme Court nominee that the president eventually makes. Normally that would occur as part of the hearings process, but yes. if the hearings process is stopped as it's promised to be, is the White House prepared to put a nominee out on Sunday talk shows or YouTube interviews with celebrities, or how is the White House going to make the case to the American people, as the president indicated yesterday, that this is the right person, given that the, the major forum for that may be close to them? We, we've actually been talking about having Zach Galifianakis down at the White House. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look, uh, Jared, I, I think that presupposes uh, Republicans uh, not fulfilling their constitutional duty. And uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, continue to make the case that they should do their job. Uh, and the President's going to put forward an individual that I think will uh, be able to make a compelling case that they deserve, they merit serious consideration for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. This individual will have an opportunity uh, to spend some time on Capitol Hill in private with members of the Senate first. Uh, hopefully we'll see senators take those meetings. Uh, there are some Republicans who are promising not to. Uh, we'll see how that goes over. Uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're still counting on uh, the President's nominee uh, getting uh, a fair hearing and a timely yes or no vote. One of the, uh, Mark mentioned some of the slides that weren't in your presentation at the top. Another one that wasn't there was the 63 percent of the American people that believe that the United States is headed in the wrong direction. Despite the facts that you put out there, the feeling is very much against the administration. How do you respond to that again, kind of looking ahead to the, uh, the debate tonight? Again, I, I think I responded to the way that we started this briefing, which is that if you ask a very focused question, uh, just objectively, not in a poll, but just objectively, looking at the facts, looking at the condition of the country in 2009 uh, and looking at the country in uh, 2016, uh, there's no denying that on a whole variety of measures, uh, whether it's the housing market, whether it is uh, comparing our nation's uh, economic strength to other countries, uh, or it's uh, the auto industry, uh, or even the unemployment rate, uh, that uh, America is in a much stronger position now than we were seven years ago. I would be readily, I'd be ready to willingly admit to you that that is due primarily to the grit, determination, uh, and innovation of American entrepreneurs, American businessmen, and most importantly, American workers. But it's the President's policies that made that possible. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that's why the President's looking forward to campaigning for a Democratic nominee uh, in the summer and in the fall who will be committed to building on that progress. And lastly, Josh, uh, if we looked at a word cloud of uh, what's been said in the briefing, no one has said the name David Duke in this briefing more than you. And so I wonder if you have a reaction to uh, David Duke urging supporters to vote for Donald Trump, as has recently been reported. Uh, I hadn't heard, uh, I hadn't seen those reports. Uh, I, I don't really have an immediate reaction. So, all right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks,